Welcome to Transform with Taz. This is a show where we take those wonderful recipes that we love, that just warm our heart and soul, and we transform them into a healthier version. In addition, we sit down with newsmakers from all across the country and learn at their feet of how they managed to get from their thens into their nows. I wanted to go really light today, so we're going to cook some tuna steaks when I come back. Now you know the routine. I gotta break away so I can get my hat on so mama won't beat me up. You know how she is. Hey mama. I'll be right back. Dr. Teresa A. Smith, also known as Dr. Taz. Graves Disease and Gastric Sleeve Surgery Protein Focused Home Cook and Talk Show Host feeds your physical, mental, and spiritual body. Time to transform with Taz. I'm back. I've got my head on. I've just put some oil in my skillet. I've got my eye on. And so we're just waiting for this to warm up. Um, and I was saying, uh, off camera, but we're on camera now, that I used to eat a lot of tuna. And I wasn't so inventive at that point about how to spice it up. And so I really sort of got tired of eating tuna. And tuna is very high in protein. It's a very lean piece of seafood, low carbs, so it's very healthy. And of course, you know, most of us grew up probably having tuna out of the can, which is great, because I do like tuna out of the can, but it's something about having a actual tuna steak. Now this particular tuna steak, I have marinated in I don't know how many different things, but I can tell you one thing that I did put in here. I put sesame seed oil, because I can smell it. I put sesame seed oil, and I put ginger, I put parsley, I'm pretty sure I put some minced garlic, I can see that. Probably put a little onion powder. I think I put a little black pepper and a little cayenne pepper. I hope I didn't put too much. And I did some Himalayan salt because I was trying to get the flavor to go through. I'm old school. I like putting things in the Ziploc bag. Uh, I grew up seeing my mother batter her chicken or her pork chop years ago in that bag. And so I'm just used to doing that. Also, it makes it easy for me to then seal it and put it in the fridge. I'm thinking that our skillet is about ready. So we're going to, and because I'm trying to keep my hands clean so I don't have to go over and wash them, but if I have to, we will. I'm gonna use my trusty tongs to get my tuna. And you see my tuna is nice and marinated. Now I'm gonna step back, because you know, this is grease. And it's hot. We're going to put that there. We're going to grab the next piece of tuna. I'm going to close up my marinade. Now I've been told the trick to tuna is that we've got to cook it fast. I'm just going to reach here, grab a paper towel, and we're not going to cook this but about two minutes on each side. Okay? Two minutes. Because I still want to see some pinkness in my tuna when we slice into it. Okay? I want some pinkness. But tuna, you know, whenever I'm out and I get tuna, it's always perfect. And I've been trying to figure out how can I duplicate the quality of the tuna that I have when I'm in restaurants because I like tuna. And I want my tuna to be just as good, if not better, than their tuna. So I'm just moving it around because it's, it's cooking. But I don't want it to... Um, I'm going to flip it now. I said I was going to do two minutes, but I don't think so, per slide, because she's cooking fast, and I do want some pinkness 
in my tuna. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off the eye also because I want my tuna pink. So basically what I'm doing is I'm just getting a crust, so to speak, on each side because I don't want it overly cooked. So we'll give it another minute and then we're going to take it off the eye and we're going to let it rest and then we're going to slice into it and see what we've got. Okay. I think we're good. So I'm going to remove my tuna from that eye where it's really hot and we're going to just let it rest there for a minute or two and then we're going to come back and we're going to slice into it and we're going to give mom a call and see if she remembers when I used to eat a lot of tuna. I'm sure I took them some because I always give them some because I want them to give me their opinion and that I'm pretty sure my tuna wasn't very tasty but I got accustomed to it but I think this is going to be the bomb. So I'll be back in just a moment. Are you tired of eating bland, boring, healthy meals? Well, imagine if you could indulge in mouth-watering recipes that are both healthy and flavorful. Now you can, thanks to Dr. Taz. In her new cookbook, Transform with Taz, Healthy Recipes, Dr. Taz reveals her secrets to transforming everyday recipes into wholesome, delicious creations. You'll enjoy your favorite comfort foods guilt-free without sacrificing flavor. Dr. Taz has not only made Southern classics delectable, but also turn them into protein-packed, nutritious powerhouses. With each bite, you'll be nourishing your body and satisfying your taste buds. Cooking healthy meals doesn't have to be a chore. It can be a joyous experience with bold, crave-worthy flavors. Dr. Taj shares her insider tips and tricks for crafting protein-rich dishes that will leave you wanting more. Don't miss out on this culinary adventure that your taste buds won't soon forget. Get your copy of Transform with Taz Healthy Recipes today. And I'm back! My tuna is still sizzling, but I'm going to take up a piece and I'm going to put it on my platter. And I'm just going to lift this piece here so that it's not sitting actually on the heat. Okay? So it's resting on that turner. So, oops, I need a knife. And while I'm getting my knife out, I'm going to see if I can get Mama on the phone. I have poured up some guacamole salsa to give it a little spice. I'm going to go Mexican here. Now let me see here if I can get Mama on the phone. You know, Mama has a very busy schedule. And sometimes she says she's just not available to be talking to me about my food. And, I, you know, I'm going to be honest. I get to feel in some kind of way. And they might just fuss me out for calling. They already told me that I need to be recording them once they get off the phone with me. That's where the real uh, story lies. So I just don't know if they'll even answer. Sometimes I wonder, and I know they're there, because I was talking to them earlier today. But who knows with Mama? Hey, Mama. Hey, Mama. How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm doing okay. Guess what I cooked, Mama? What did you cook? I cooked tuna. You cook what now? Tuna. Oh, tuna. Okay. So I cooked tuna. I marinated these tuna steaks in uh, sesame seed oil, black pepper, soy sauce, a little cayenne, pepper, parsley, minced garlic, and oregano. And so I uh, cooked them. I haven't tasted them, so I said, well, I'm going to try it with Mama to see how it tastes. And so I'm cutting into my steak now. Yay! I said I'm cutting into my steak now, and well, my tuna steak. And I'm saying yay to the camera and to the audience because it seems like it seems like I always have. Uh, it seems like Trinity is always trying to out talk me. She's the Trinity is my niece. 
And whenever I'm on the phone, she's always tried to out talk me. She's always tried to out talk me, whether I'm talking to her mom or she's at my mom's house. She's always trying to out talk me. And so I was excited because I just sliced into my tuna and my tuna is pink on the inside which means I did not overcook it. So this should be really good. So my first bite, I'm not even gonna dip it. My first bite, I just gotta try it naked. Okay, then let me know how it tastes. It's well seasoned. Okay. It's well seasoned. Oh. It's well seasoned. So it's good, huh? Mm -hmm. nah. And now that you put on it, you did say salt to this. Yes, I left that off, but I did put some salt in here. I use the uh, Himalayan salt because I can taste okay. the salt. So it's got to be the salt and the soy sauce that's coming through okay. Okay. along with the uh, sesame seed oil. This is really good. I, I, I got all that, but I, I said, hmm, did I hear salt? <laughs> I mama said this should hear salt. It. Yes, mama. I, I put salt, mama, because your mama oh, wants okay. salt and okay. sugar. So now I'm going to dip it in my guacamole sauce. Did y'all hear mama say, ew, she's going to be in Lucille Ball again. I like it. You like it? Mm-hmm. Let me tell you what I'm going to do. I like guacamole. I know, mama. Now you know if you like it now, you know. I like it. But I tell you what I'm going to... I get mine and something else. I don't know what it is right now, but something. Well, I can tell you what I would probably dip this in. What, mama? What you dip it in? Just a little old sesame dressing. A little ranch dressing. I don't like ranch dressing. That would be good. Look at that. Look at that. You see that pink tuna on the inside? You look at that. You see my tuna is pink. I am so proud of myself. It's pink on the inside, huh? Yes, I am right. so proud of myself. I am so, so proud of myself. Because like I said, guys, I've cooked a lot of tuna. And, you know, this is the prettiest tuna I have ever cooked. And I feel really good because I got a chance to cook uh, tuna steaks and I've been cooking tuna steaks wrong for years. So when you learn to cook them the right way, they really are good. You know, as I told them, you know, I go to restaurant. Yeah, I go to the restaurant and, you know, they're good, but they're pink on the inside. And I just I figured out now how to cook them. And I've tried cooking them many different ways, and uh, this really turned out well. I basically let them stay about a minute per side. I was gonna do two minutes, but I said just a minute because I could see them, I could see it cooking, and I didn't want it to overcook. So uh, I'm just really pleased. I finally got it, so I am really happy. So I'll let you guys go. So before Trinity starts talking again, talk to you later. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Well, Mama is gone now. I think she's gone. Let me hang up, folks, before we start hearing them saying some stuff we don't want to hear on camera. But I am so excited. Uh, I finally got my tuna steaks done correctly. And that is a huge accomplishment to see that they're pink on the inside. I didn't overcook them, and they're nice and juicy. And we'll be back. Well, welcome back to my kitchen. Today, I have the honor of having Pauline Rogers with me. Pauline is from Mississippi, uh, and her life is so fascinating that I felt that you had to hear her story so that you understand that so much good can come from things that we sometimes think of as negative or that is bad. And so I can't do her story justice. So Pauline, welcome to my kitchen. Thank you, Dr. Tiles. Good to be here in the kitchen. <laughs> well, thank you. You look so pretty. Thank you. You do too, always. <laughs> well, thank you. Now, you know, they're going to say them two Southern bells, but you know, we Southern bells and mm -hmm. you know, we don't give each other compliments. You know, we can't, Wait on somebody else to do it, but really, you are a beautiful woman. You know, you're beautiful on the outside and you're beautiful on the inside. And right. so let me be the person to tell you today, if no one else has said it, you look absolutely gorgeous. Thank you. And um, 
you know, I say that also because I know the amount of work that goes into doing what you do. And I know you made a statement once that tough times don't last, but tough people do. You know, my audience right now don't understand the origin of that statement. Would you take us back just a couple of years, as my mother would say? We're not going to go back too many years. Now, I'm saying it that way, but, you know, we're going to go back some years. Mm -hmm. Would you take us back in time to help, help us to understand how you develop that mantra that tough times don't last always, but tough people do? Well, to be honest with you, Dr. Tiles, I can't remember who coined that phrase. I just borrowed it. But it taking me back to it, it was childhood being poor and watching my grandmother out of nothing create everything. And was the first person in our community to build a brick home because everybody had trailers and would live mm -hmm. on property. And seeing her come out of that, fast forwarding from that point, I landed in prison serving time when I felt I had no option, the oldest of 11, watched my father be killed at the hand of my mother. I spiraled down. I was always told that I had to help with my younger siblings. I took that literally and would take my siblings to funerals, not to grieve with bereaved families, but to get to the repast. And 40, so over 40 years ago, you went to a repast and it was not like today where you go in and the plates are prepared in the styrofoam plates. You could easily leave with a whole casserole cake, pan of bread, whole dish of rice, et cetera. So I would take the more children we took, the more they saw, the more food we got. And so I survived through that, survived that, survived prison. And that's where for me, that statement resonated all the more. Tough times don't last, but tough people do. Because I lasted, made it out of that. You know, I, I want to touch on just several things. You said that your grandmother was the first person in your community to build a brick home? Yes, she was the first. What type of work did your grandmother do? She was a laundry. She did. She worked at the military base, Kiesler Air Force Base, and she was a laundry lady. I mean, that was her job. But those pennies she saved from working that job, you know, she was a great manager of finances and a great business person. We had a farm. She was a farmer. You know, we corn, peas, you know, and we had pigs and chickens. And so we raised everything. And she was a great negotiator. Uh, we were, I learned to negotiate watching my grandmother, you know, feel, have us feel sacks of corn. And she would go down the street where they had eggs, where her eggs didn't turn over. And she would negotiate to exchange one crop for something else, for flower or plant or a, a mess of greens, as they call it. It wasn't a bunch of greens. They, it was a mess of greens. Mm -hmm. And so... I, I learned that from her. So she was the first person in our community. And fast forward to this day, there are still very few that have broken that cycle. You know, uh, I, I call women like your grandmother, women before their time. I call them Renaissance women. Really? You know, to think about, because we know how old we are, but we're not going to talk about that part of it. And we're very thankful to be the ages that we are. But you think back because you're talking about your grandmother, not your mother. Right. You're talking about your grandmother. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had this affinity to my grandmother, my mom's mom. And I love my grand my dad's mom, but I didn't know my mother's mother. And so, um, so for me, when I hear stories of women of that generation who were just brilliant, brilliant. just brilliant. And what they were able to do, it just does my heart good. And I made a little note here because we're going to come back to your grandmother. Mm -hmm. Now, you talked about, um, which I think is so fascinating, um, when you would take your siblings to funerals or to the wait in order to bring food back into the home. Now, I know you mentioned that your mom um, killed your father. Did your mom serve any uh, prison time for that? No, it was done in self-defense. And Mississippi to date still does not have a self-defense law, but it was done in self-defense. 
And the other side of that, what I'm learning is years later, I don't think my father had to die. There was not a rural, a hospital in this rural town. And to date, there still isn't. And the hospital, nearest hospital is 40, 45 minutes away. So I don't think my father had to die. It was the amount of time coupled with perhaps the injury that he, he, he lost his life in, in that. And so that is an area that has become of interest to me that needs addressing in that community. Absolutely, because when you're saying even today, 45 minutes to the nearest hospital. 45 minutes to the nearest hospital. So if there's an emergency like that or someone has fallen and really hurt themselves, I'm not talking broke bones, then you're racing against time mm -hmm. trying to get them to the hospital. Right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And it's probably the, the turnaround time now is perhaps a little bit quicker because they built extended roads and bridges, but back then it was worse. So the turnaround time today may be better than 45 minutes, but back then there was one mm -hmm. way in and one way out. Yeah, we're talking those two lanes, uh, two lane roads. Right, mm -hmm. right. You know, um, that's interesting to be able to look at that incident from that lens, because you're right. You know, regardless of what was happening with your mom and your dad, the medical treatment would have been another character mm -hmm. in that story because mm -hmm. it wouldn't have been available quick enough. Again, because we're talking about uh, several, some years back, guys, and the two way, uh, the two lane highways. So that's a very uh, important thing as we talk about healthcare in America and mm -hmm. access. Right. You know, not gonna. I don't think we're gonna go down that line, but just to point that out, you know, access to healthcare. Right. Because for most of us, we think, well, you know, like where I live, you know, there's not a doctor's office on every corner, but pretty much because I'm not out in the country per se. So there is really no uh, reason why a person couldn't get to a medical facility quickly. Um, but I will say this, not all, I'm in North Carolina, but not all parts of North Carolina are like that. Mm -hmm. There's still some areas where it takes some time to get to appropriate medical care. But I wanna go back to taking your siblings to the funerals or the wait. What gave you that idea to do that? How did you know to do it? The only thing I can come up with, that, Dr. Thomas, I'm a church girl. I wasn't a Christian when I was going to church. I was a church girl because that was not an option in, in, in my grandmother's home. And I, I had my mother, but I'm a granny baby. I, I always cling to my grandmother. And she was a devout Christian taught Sunday school. I was in her Sunday school class. We all were. We had to listen to her lessons at home and then church. So I think that came from, from being there and having that wisdom and that intuition, that inner voice without knowing to call it that inner voice. Because when I would hear stuff like that years ago, I would say something, something told me or yeah. something say it. Mm -hmm. And so fast forward and I, years later, that something is the prophetic voice of God that I would call. Even in that wrong, it was deceptive, but it was not a criminal deception. I mean, a criminal act, but it was a deceptive act. But those deceptive acts, even biblically written, save lives. The story of Rahab hiding the soul, it was deceptive but it saved the nation and the people. So I think it was, uh, uh, well, no, no thing. I know fast forward years later, it was the voice of God that was in operation. And I'm, I'm gonna agree with you because, you know, we could say it was mother wit, we could say it was many different things, but you were a child. Right. So, as you said, it, it was that voice that was saying to you, and you whether you hear it like we hear ourselves right now, but you know the voice, and it's right. like, do this. And I think about um, by your doing that and being brave, because I would think in some of those, uh, when you would go to some of those uh, funerals, the folks would have known you guys. 
Well, the funerals we went to were the church where I grew up at. Because oh. my home was away from, you know, so it was, it didn't matter the race, the nationality, or the ethnic group. If it was a funeral, we went to it. And there were all nationalities and races of funerals that we attended. They were not at my home church. They were everybody else's church because I knew my home church would know. So it was very intentional not to go to my home church because they knew uh, that I would have been up to something, you know. And so, but it was my way of getting ahead, trying to stay ahead. The more food we got, that was the more I could freeze, the more we could preserve, the more we had. Um, so, it, no, it was intentional not to go to my home church unless it was a time where our home church was a funeral. So that meant, were you driving? How did you guys get to we these? We were walking. These funerals were done with, that was in walking distance. Churches okay. that were in walking distance from where we live. Now, mind you, I was a granny girl, but we were at home with my mother. My mother, who was a workaholic by the time she got out of, out of jail, because she was not allowed to go to my dad's funeral because of protective custody. Uh, it was self, being self-defense. But, you know, in cases like that years ago, that's the way they handled mm -hmm. them. But uh, it, these were funerals that were in the neighborhood that were walking distance that we could could get to. And these my siblings would cry. I would cry. And I remember once one of my siblings asked me, Polly, who, who is that? And I felt like my cover was blown. You know, it wasn't a cover. I knew what I was doing. They didn't. And when she asked it, I thought, well, I better find something else because my cover has been blown. That was just the way I was processing as a child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, without knowing that I still could have gone to funerals. Well, I, did your mother know that you were going to these funerals? No, she was at work. She was at work. But did she see the food there? Well, but we ate so much. Yes, yeah, she mm -hmm. saw the food, but I mm -hmm. was—I had to cook as well. Yes. So she yeah. didn't know the difference in whether I was cooking or I had cooked. Because that was one thing you talk about your, your cooking show. One thing that I had to do growing up was cook. And I cooked from scratch. And I cooked all the time because my grandmother, we had to, you know, cook all the time. Um, so they didn't know the, know the difference unless there was just something. I Every once in a while, I may say, have said that we went to a funeral. But it wasn't often that I revealed what I was doing. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what comes to mind is that God certainly had his hands on you mm -hmm. because you were able to go to these funerals that were in walking distance. Mm -hmm. And the people, because we're talking some years back, guys, mm -hmm. and they welcomed you, all nationalities. Mm -hmm. They welcomed you and your siblings and you left with food. Mm -hmm. And I'm and not saying point, I did have a car. At some point, my mother did get a car and I was able to drive. No, I did not have license, but I was a very responsible driver and I would drive sometimes to funeral. It was the car that was left for me to be able to use. And sometimes I would drive. Well, I still say that, you know, God had his hand on you uh, to have you to find favor as you guys went to those different funerals, because I'm not going to say that you we'd walk, be able to walk into places like that. Now, even if the food, they had abundance of food and people would be receptive to us in yeah. all spaces. Yeah. So just hearing that, it lets me to know that God had his hand on you at a very, very early age. Mm -hmm. Now, what was it that helped you to understand that you were not responsible for your siblings? Because basically you have been taking care of your siblings uh, when your mom was at work and then doing this extra to make sure that they were taken care of. What was that point in your life that you understood that you were not physically res or financially responsible for them? Unfortunately, I didn't learn that until I got to prison, until I was locked up. And they had volunteers who were mothers, some were grandmothers. And this lady told me once that it was not my, that was not my responsibility. And for the first time I heard it and I heard it a different way. And the weight of that, of course I'm locked up now where I can't do anything, 
but I my healing started because mm -hmm. I always felt that I was responsible. And when you've been told that all your life, it's hard for you to separate yourself from that. And so I began, it wasn't until I was in prison that I got separated from. That was not my responsibility. And the healing started. The healing started. When the healing started, how did you know that you were turning the page or you were on a different path? How did you know it? Because I started to like myself. I didn't like myself. I didn't like because I was being everything for what everybody else said I was supposed to be, who I was supposed to be, what I was supposed to be like. And so that's when I knew when healing started, when I started thinking, I want to do this. I want to, you know, is when I started knowing that my healing was taking place and I was becoming okay with it. I was becoming okay with fear. With mm. fear meaning, okay, I'm saying that, but I'm trying to hold on at the same time because I didn't want to be rejected by family, rejected by friends. I didn't want the rejection. Um, but I, there were people that were raised up in prison that had mentored me that I wanted to stick around in the area where I did time at time where I served my time, get out, become a new person, live the new me. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to do that uh, because I was afraid of what I was like. And although I liked it, I didn't know how to embrace or even be that new person because I was that new person behind bars. And I didn't know if that was going to be really me when I got out because I had heard about jailhouse religion, jailhouse. And so the test came afterwards. Well, now, you know, for me, it's like hearing about this new birth because, you know, you said the healing began. Well, now you become a new person. And like you said, the test becomes when you leave, will you be able to maintain that? Mm -hmm. Now, and I know that you did, but do you, why, why were you able to maintain? Let me ask the question that way. Why were you able to maintain it that knew you to remove that fear once you did um, come out of prison? Well, I knew beyond the shadow. I had a relationship. I was no longer just a church girl. Mm -hmm. I had a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I knew that I was, I knew internally that I was different. But I didn't know what that different walking it out would be mani manifested would look like. But that was the number one thing. And then I had advocates who, who other people who were mentoring me, guiding me, supporting me. And I leaned on, I leaned on those people. And it didn't matter what race, what side of the fence they came on. I leaned on those people who genuinely and authentically embraced me. And that was the isn't difference it, for me. Isn't it wonderful to be genuinely, authentically embraced? Yes. yes. Because, you know, it sounds so cliche, but lots of times we are not genuinely, authentically embraced for who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's for who people want us to be. Right. Or who they think we're going to be, mm -hmm. but not who you are at that moment in time. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe, and you correct me, one of those individuals was Wendy Hatchett. Absolutely. She was That's the poor being. So now tell us about Wendy now. She was the first woman chaplain that was hired by the state of Mississippi to be a chaplain in the prison. She was the first woman. She had no reason to be. She started off as a volunteer in prison ministry. She's from England, a British lady from England, uh, but married a British soldier who, a, a Marine, uh, relocated to this uh, country of uh, the United States and became a volunteer with the church where her husband went to church at, became a volunteer in the prison and volunteered and was a big hit. And when the position came open was uh, encouraged to apply and applied and was the first woman 
that was hired back in the late 60s, early 70s, I believe it was, and uh, was the chaplain that moved from Parchman. I never went to Parchman. When I left the county jail, they kept us there until they built the facility in Pearl, Mississippi. And she was the senior chaplain there. And she picked me out of the hundreds of women in that facility. And I knew that is when the story of Joseph came mm -hmm. alive and real in my life. I literally was the Joseph inside that prison. I mean, that's, that story became more real to me than I had ever read it because I was the person that was put in a position. She picked me out before I was classified. You have to mm -hmm. go through a classification process in prison. You you stay in this yellow can canary yellow jumpsuit until you meet the classification board. The classification board consists of a psychological evaluation, social skills evaluation, and your uh, actual uh, educational skills and educational level to see where, if or if you could even be placed on a job in prison. And so I was picked out before any of this had taken place. Well, in prison, I learned years later after being there that they thought I was somebody big and important. And they, they classified me as somebody with big feet. You know, if you got big feet, that means you were somebody. I didn't have a clue what, what that meant until years later. And I went, no, honey, this was, a good, this was totally a God thing. Totally a God thing. I was put in a position uh, that I had access to the free world could talk to people in the free world, get resources. And so it, it was a God thing. So Wendy Hatcher, I always told her uh, when I got out of prison, she opened her door and allowed me to live with her against the MDOC rules and policies to live with her. We undercover, uh, you know, I lived with her three years before I got married. And she was my matron of honor in my wedding 31 years ago. Uh, and so the Lord just used her in so many ways. And I often told her that I was going to open up a home to help other women coming out of prison. I wanted to do for other women what she did for me. And, but it didn't start off with me just wanting to help other women. I started off doing the housing to see if it would work. Cause I was trying to save myself. Yes. I was trying to keep myself saved and free because women, in the prison had educated me how hard it was once you got out of prison, you couldn't get a job. They named everything that couldn't happen. And so I was on a mission to start the work, to be the own, to be the recipient of my own work to save me. And if it were, if it worked, then we would save others. And so that's how the work began. Not that I had this big vision going coming out the bag with, I'm going to save all these hundreds of, th mm -mm. it was me first. Everybody else was going to latch on to what happened with me. And the legs just began, the fingers and the toes began to latch on from that with saving me first. Now I'm thankful to Wendy Hatcher because that's, and, and the other part with Wendy Hatcher is, I always told her that, if she ever got to the point of being ill and needed a caretaker, that she didn't have to worry about who that would be. If I was in my right mind and in good health, that I would. Well, I'm taking care of her. She is living with me. She is 87 living with me. And I, I'm thankful for every second of that. Yep, 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 yep. Uh Sometimes I feel like I cry on every episode, guys. I'm sorry. But there's so many things I want to say. You know, you talk about when, you know, Wendy, first of all, she's British. Mm -hmm. And to come here as a woman and become the first female chaplain in Mississippi, mm -hmm. in a prison. In a prison. In a prison. She is a woman among women. And then for her to pick you out, 
before you were classified. And as you said, with the big feet, because it's like you are, you 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 you're there, but you don't even really exist yet because you hadn't gone through all the uh, processing. Right. We need to pick you out, and then and like you said, like Joseph, and and then you got access. You 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 walking with her like you you walking with your mentor, mm -hmm. learning, and you are, who are you? Mm -hmm. And to see how God was weaving all of that, and then to see where you are now, I, I guess what comes to mind is He gave you. You were raised by your grandmother. Mm -hmm. And you said you was, you was a church girl. You was your grandmother's uh, grandbaby. Mm -hmm. And from her, we got we began to get that business acuity, the negotiating skills, the wisdom, the intuition. Then he said, let me refine it. Mm -hmm. So he put you in a position where he sent someone who could refine what he had already instilled in you because you had it, because you you were astute enough to know how to pick up the newspaper and pick funerals that people didn't know you, but you still were able to walk in there uh, with your siblings, get food, leave with food, not a plate, as you said, you leave with a casserole, leave with real food, did that walk, and then you did that driving, did not get picked up for driving without a license. You hadn't said that you had. So I'm assuming you were able to do all that. That's that favor. And then to meet Wendy, who then began to refine all of that. And as you say, you came out of prison not to save others with that in your mind, but to save yourself, to make sure that you were able to deal with all the obstacles that the women had talked about that really increased the recidivism rate right. is the reason why they were going back because they that there wasn't a plan that really worked that met their criteria, the, the barriers that they had. And so when I hear all of that, and then I see you remaining true to your word with Wendy and you're her caretaker, I just look at how God was just ordering your steps mm -hmm. and all the work that you do now. So now we're going to fast forward because they don't know all the work that you do now. Talk with us about the transitional, I'm going to say housing, but I really, I may really mean the transitional programming that you and your husband do in order to help ex-offenders be successful because you guys have been doing this for like almost 30 years and you've got a long track record of helping people to be successful when they come out of prison. Well, again, Dr. Tiles, we didn't have a model and giving people a safe home to live in when they came out didn't start with us having an official home. It started with me having an extra room where I live and a lady came out of prison needing somewhere to stay. And the home came, this official home didn't come into 2016. But everywhere we live, my husband and I, since we've been married, we've never been alone. Every extra, extra room has always been a field room. Um, and that's what it, it came out of. And the Lord had challenged us, if you believe in what it is you're doing, you be the, you be the first sacrificer. You be the first investor. And that's where it came from. Because we didn't have, you would think that people that looked like me would support it, women would support it. But those are the worst opponents, the worst adversaries that we have had with people who look like us and the people who didn't. We on every hand, even the church, mm -hmm. were our biggest, app, you, it was like, okay, where's the help? And the Lord had to console us with, you got me. I am enough. Mm -hmm. and 
My husband would tell me all the time, he calls me boo. Boo, just do the work. In tears, I would just do the work. When I didn't know what to do, I'd do the work. And people were coming to us with all kind of needs from the prison. I didn't know. I still don't know. I have to go try to find it out or figure it out. And the very first lady that I gave a place to live in 1989 is in a urn, a mm -hmm. mahogany urn that sits on this mantle in this house. Before Facebook was popular, it was MySpace. I posted a picture of her. Only picture I had was her driver's license then. Nobody ever came forward. This was in my space. Mm -hmm. My husband went, she got sick and had to go to a nursing home because she needed some special breathing equipment that the only time you could get it then, back then was at a nursing home or rehab facility. No money, no resources. I went to every nursing home in, in Jackson, Mississippi. Finally found a home and a lady that said she would take her and she took her. She stayed there for some years. She got sicker, needed to go to another home. I never left her. I would visit her every single day. And she got moved to this other nursing home, but I couldn't get there as often because she was hours away now. And she finally called and, you know, I was wanting to see her. She was, I said, look, can you get moved to the Mississippi Gulf Coast at a nursing home there? Even if I can't, I go that direction frequently. And even if I can't, I have family and friends that I can call that can get there quick. So she did. So we were able to go visit her more. She stayed there for like three, maybe four years before she actually died. And she used to call me sister. Mm -hmm. And when she when I would go, she wanted the people to know, this is my sister. And I would just acknowledge, yeah, I'm a sister. Never told anybody that I wasn't her sister. Fast forwarding, she ended up sick unto death and the doctor would call her. And I'm making decision, but not knowing I'm really making the decision. And when she died and they released all of her belongings to me, all in her health records, in case of emergency, contact my sister and it had my name, blew me away. That I was saying this, but I wasn't, knowing that I was really in this role. And when she took her last breath, I couldn't let the state bury her because I had been in her life for years, decades. And cause she died from the eighties and she died in the mid two thousands. And we buried her, had a memorial service. There was nobody but my husband and myself. And I think we invited a witness and we had to put in a mahogany urn so that if somebody came forward, you know, I wouldn't, we had her. Well, when Facebook came along, I reposted it with the memorial. Nobody ever came forward. From that day she died to this day, nobody. And so every time we move and go somewhere, we don't stick her in a closet. She's very visible in the home because she was a human being. She was a person. And so it's those kind of issues with people that are incarcerated, that all of their family members die out or they fade out of their lives, that we still give them the humanity that they deserve. Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us all and, and she was human. And so we try to keep that very realistic about who they are, about who I am and not just them. I, I'm fighting for people that, we, that I am. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, 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 I know that you're advocating and your husband does the same thing for the men and women and that lack of support, as you're saying, you know, here it is, you know, we, for those of us who don't work in this arena, we just think that the family's going to be there. And that's not always the case, even if they haven't died out. You know, we just assume that they're going to pick them up and they're going to have a place to live. They're going to help them get a job. They're going to help them get on their feet. And that's not the case. And so when I hear her story and how you really were her sister because she didn't have anyone else. 
And to think that you've done your time, you come out and you're trying to do the right thing, but you have no connection. And having someone or a group of people that you're connected to is so important. Um, and her life is an illustration of that, that you were that person for her. It is so important. And I understand a lot of family members are burned out because their loved one has stole this antique chair, this antique silver that was in the family for hundreds of years and they just burn out. And so I used to have this saying about, you know, when you go to prison, um, it, it, prison was the best thing ever happened to me. That's not what I was saying. I said it, but that's not what I meant. And when I hear people say it now, they're saying it, but that's not what they mean. What they mean is I like the new person that I have become while I was in yes. prison. But prison is set, make no mistake about it. Prison is set out to do one thing, one thing and three things, steal, kill, and destroy. That's what prison is set out to do. And it's doing a great job of it. And right now, today, as we speak, right at during COVID, a lady, a 77 year old lady got out of prison June the 7th under the uh, former president's administration CARES Act. And she survived lung cancer, several other things. She has been picked back up and relocked up after serving 16 years. And she was in class. When she got a call, well, you can't answer a phone in the classroom. She was sitting in class. And so she's been rearrested for violating and sitting back. So we got some injustice issues in this country that need addressing. It doesn't matter what color you are. And the fact that it is primarily people of color, then it needs addressing. And I am going to live out my days addressing as much as I can that's in my power. And I by no means know a whole lot. But I am willing and sacrificially going to address what I can address or be vocal about addressing what needs to be addressed. Pauline, you're going to have to come back because we got lots of other things that we could talk about. Um, you know, Pauline is passionate and she's brilliant. You can see that she's a thinker. Uh, she's passionate about ex-offenders. She's passionate about the homeless. We didn't even get a chance to talk about them. She's passionate about children and their education and their opportunities. And, you know, I like the fact that you said we do, we master everything that God has told us to touch. I love that. And also we appreciate the uniqueness, that unique gift that God has put in each of us and stop being the crowds in the back, the crabs in the bucket meaning coveting what other people have, because you're right. I heard a sermon many moons ago now, and there was a female preacher, and she's like, you want what I have, but do you want to go through what I went through in order to get it? And people want your success. They don't want your ups and downs. They don't want the nights that you cry. They don't want those nights when you couldn't figure out, you know, am I going to be able to pay my electrical bill? Do I have enough gas to go to work? They don't want none of that. All they want is the shiny penny or the shining quarter because a penny they ain't want no penny. But they just want what shines like gold. They don't want it before when it was tarnished. But you got to go through that tarnished part in order to be able to handle it. And so I just thank you for imparting all of this wisdom with us. Now, Pauline. I know you have a nonprofit. Tell us what your nonprofit is, because I know nonprofits are always uh, looking for donations. And tell the audience how they can um, stay in touch with you. Our nonprofit is called Reaching and Educating for Community Hope Foundation. We use the acronyms R-E-C-H, pronounced REACH. We have a website, www.rechfoundationms.org. And our motto is simple. We helping families, individuals and families impacted by crime and incarceration. And our vision is simple for them to be in a, a thriving and sustainable community that's inclusive of them, that there's no separation on this side of the track versus the other. Very simple. Uh, they can reach us, call me 
2970 or email R E C H Pauline P A U L I N E at gmail.com. We would love to have you on board working with us. Well, guys, you've heard it from Pauline. Uh, her foundation is Reach, Reaching and Educating for Community Hope Foundation. We will make sure that it's also included uh, in the video so that folks have the information. Pauline, thank you for coming and spending time with me in the kitchen today. I, I'm going to have you back at some other time, and we're just going to pick a topic, and we're just going to go at it on that topic. Yeah. Thank you. I love being in the kitchen with you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can cook as good as Grandma, since I know Grandma's got a special place in your heart, but I do pretty good, though. I believe you. Thank you. I am right. here. Thank you so much, Pauline. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. So now, if you want me to transform your recipe, you know what you have to do. You've got to send me an email to transformwithtaz at gmail.com. Put recipe in the subject line. Make sure you include your first and last name and, of course, the recipe. And you never know when your recipe may be featured on Transform with Todd, where we are feeding our bodies healthy foods that are good foods, but kind of bad, healthy, good, bad foods. And we are feeding our soul. Until next time, as always, take care of you so you can take care of someone else. Bye now.